Graham Agars joins us to discuss 321. Graham, I've been so looking forward to, to picking your brains and talking about this. So a year ago, if we were having this discussion, John Rahm was standing alongside his good mate, Rory McIlroy, and they were both bemoaning live golf, the whole experience, and that they wouldn't jump. Well, a year later, John Rahm has accepted a huge pay packet to go. So there's so many questions around this. Does it come down to the fact that, look, none of us can look each other in the eye, Graham, and honestly say for 600 million US dollars, there's not a lot that we probably wouldn't turn our back on. Well, in a way, it's the timing of it that counts. Um, you know that I'm, I'm not a fan of live. I'm not a fan of three days, uh, three round golf. I'm not a fan of having a, uh, a tournament within a tournament. That is the team event within the singles event because it compromises players without question. I mean, if a guy needs to make two birdies in the last three holes to get his team across the line, or he needs to par in to win the individual competition, He's not going to do the team thing. So already that's compromised. And and uh, a- anybody should be able to see that. But, you know, Liv is hanging its hat on this thing and thinks the teams are going to be huge and they're going to be worth lots of money and sponsors will buy in and the guys are going to make all sorts of money out of it. And, and, and they continue, they can continue with this sort of tournament within a tournament thing. And, and, and it just doesn't work. If you look at tennis... Uh, there are many occasions uh, going back a little bit, I guess, when the top players would play doubles until they got into the second week in singles and then they'd say to their doubles partner, I'm sorry, I can't play. The singles is more important. And, it, and, and you know, golf is in the same position. Golf is basically a singles game. That's what makes it. But the big problem that happened in all of this is the PGA Tour initially stood on its legacy and said, if you want... Uh, to have a legacy in golf if you want to be recognised as a great golfer you play the PGA Tour because that's what uh, history is built on, that's what Ben Hogan played on, that's what Jack Nicklaus played on, that's what Arnold Palmer played on and that's how they built their reputations in addition to winning the majors. So all of that was a clear fight between Liv, this upstart with tons of money, uh, so it was it was wealth, not legacy and, and the PGA Tour was standing on legacy. And then, for some reason or other, probably because the legal costs were getting too high, the PGA Tour themselves started negotiating with the Saudis. And you remember that disastrous rollout the week of the Canadian Open, when uh, Jay Monaghan, the commissioner of the PGA Tour, was absolutely pilloried for his hypocrisy um, after, you know, standing on, on the legacy uh, bit and, and then it suddenly went to the wealth bit. So uh, it, it became a disaster from there on in. And in the back of the players' minds, they're going, well, if it's good enough for the PGA Tour to negotiate with the Saudis, why isn't it good enough for us? And that's brought about the current problem. What does it mean, though? And this is what we're all trying to get our heads around, because what I don't understand is I thought after they signed that deal in in June that the two were coming back together and that what we'd see is some kind of a hybrid of Live Golf and the PGA. I don't know who's going to own it or who's going to run it or whatever. But why do the Saudis need or still need him right now? Because this is part of the power battle in the negotiations. I always thought that the Live Legacy argument plus the fact that the American government wasn't particularly keen on the Saudis taking over or effectively taking over the PGA Tour. Um, I, I, you know, I thought that was a pretty strong leg to stand on. But as I said, once that broke down, um, it's, it, it's now a negotiation. Um, the PGA Tour is already talking to the Saudis. So the Saudis are thinking, well, we've got to get the best deal we possibly can. How can we put pressure on them? I know. Let's get the checkbook out and try and sign one of the top three. And and John Rahm was the guy who was willing to go. And and it, it's nothing to do with Rahm, you know, will will turn Liv around and because he's now playing, everybody's going to watch Liv golf. It's a message of the PGA Tour. Our checkbook is winning. When Jay Monaghan and the, the leader of the, the public investment fund from Saudi Arabia meet this week that uh, Ram signing was a shot across the bow. What he's saying to Jay Monaghan is, you better give us what we want in these negotiations. 
because money talks, and this is the latest evidence of it. If you want to lose all your players, I've got a checkbook big enough to gradually persuade them or nearly all of them to come across. So it was a negotiating tactic, and it surprised the PGA Tour because their understanding was, in the the mid-year announcement, that the lawsuit was off and players wouldn't be poached until this agreement uh, was finished. But the problem with that is the PGA Tour in the interim has been talking to other possible sponsors um, under pressure from the US government, partly. And and the PIF people said, well, that's not how the agreement went. And if we're going to come back and talk to you guys about finalising this thing by December 31, you need to know we're still serious. So John Rahm is a shot across the bow to the PGA Tour and... Boy, I'd love to be I'd love to be a fly on the wall in their meeting rooms now because the pressure is really on. Graham Agars is with us. We're talking about John Rahm jumping ship and going to live golf. So what you're implying is that nothing is going to get sorted in the in the immediate future. Does that mean I mean he's he's got a ticket to the to the majors next year anyway, and if he didn't, we don't know whether or not he would have signed. But a couple of things about this. Are we going to see um the 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 majors still in their current state for at least next year and, and perhaps beyond that? Or or if Live Golf actually gets what it wants, what happens to those tournaments? Are they going to be the only tournaments that we see in the world that are going to go four days, Graham? And how long does that last? Well, no, the PGA Tour will be four days for sure. They, they're not going to drop that. Um, and and the, the John Rahm thing, uh, as far as majors is concerned, he's good till 2028 which pretty much sees him through the five-year agreement <clears throat> excuse me, that he's just signed uh, with Live Golf. So uh, he'll be there. And <clears throat> here's where it gets really complicated. The, the Live Golfers are banned from playing the PGA Tour, which is where the bulk of the ranking points are, and banned from playing the European Tour, except when the European Tour co-sanctions events on the Australasian Tour, on the South African Tour, on, the, on the, some of the other smaller tours... And the live golfers have been happily playing on those events all the southern summer uh, this year uh, in Australia and South Africa and have been winning the events. Neiman won the Australian Open. Uh, a South African guy has won two events down there. That qualifies them for the British Open because there's an agreement with uh, the, the Royal and Ancient on that. So the live golfers still have avenues to get ranking points. Uh, on some of the smaller tours, particularly the Asian tour, which is basically owned by Live Golf, and and the other smaller tours that are happy to see any player come and play there. So the, the you know the majors know that bottom line, this is what's going to happen. The PGA Tour will be weakened as far as legacy and credibility is concerned. Live Golf may or may not become popular, but out of all of this, the four slams become the main focus of golf that's where everybody will meet and play and uh, the slams know or the majors i should say know that there is a way for the live golfers still to get into them is there any other golfers that are now going to make this move now that they've got him i mean rory was holding out but you know there and, and also we'll ask you about the Ryder cup in a second but you know for that amount of money staring down the barrel of that i mean morals go out the window you know there's only one decision to make isn't it do i want to be super rich for the rest of my life and then for the generations of my family for, for the next millennia as well i mean that's what you're asking so how many other golfers are now looking at it going well if ram's going to jump bugger this i'm going to go to well i know they've been after scotty scheffler <clears throat> and they would love to have rory mcelroy and i was a bit disturbed with what he said the other day yeah where he effectively said well john ram should be on the right no, yeah, cup, no a cup team, what. Yeah. Mm. yeah no matter what and he's a good friend of mine and i don't hold it against him i'm thinking are you talking to him rory <laughs> yeah you know it sounded it sounded very soft very soft and i know they're chasing scotty scheffler as i said and some of the other top players <clears throat> and those guys must think, OK, PGA Tour is talking to the Saudis. They're talking about some sort of overreaching agreement between the two tours. Why don't I cash out now, like John Rahm did, with anything up to 600 million US, according to reports, cash out now knowing that once the PGA Tour and the Saudis come to some sort of agreement, I'll probably be able to play both tours anyway. 
So in a way, John Rahm has just, you know, taken money for nothing. If that's what the circumstance is, you know, he, he, it won't affect his playing abilities on any tour anyway. So it, it's just so messy now for the PGA Tour. I, I, you know, I just don't know how they're going to navigate it because they've lost, they've, you know, they've lost the legacy argument by giving it away, not uh, pursuing it through the courts. Oh my goodness me! The platform.